Call the Frontier meeting to uh, order at 604. It's uh, February uh, 9th. Uh, first thing, um, we're going to approve minutes. Um, we got a few of them. I'm just going to go through them here. I think we'll do them all at once. And I'll tell you who was here and who wasn't here. Just get there with me for a second. Uh, you know what, Bob? Huh? I can do it. I've already set it up, so I can just read people's names, and okay. you can tell me whether or not you – but I need a motion okay. and a second. A motion. Okay. Okay. Who's second, Missy? Okay. Yeah. We got uh, – we got the regular one from January 5th. We have the uh, emergency, not emergency, but the one with the Board of Health on the 13th, the 22nd, and on the 29th. Okay, you ready? Yep. Bob Halla, present at all four meetings. Yes. Lynn Roberts, present at January 5th, January 22nd, and January 29th. Is she waving at me? Where'd she go? Okay, we'll come back to her. You get it? Uh, no. What's that? No. Phil Cantor present at one, two, everything except the 22nd. I'm, I'm a yes for approval for everything. <laughs> Thanks. Judy present at all four. Yes. Mary present at the January 5th and January 13th. Yes. Damien present at the 5th, the 13th. Uh, yes. Yes, for the ones I was there. Okay, Ashley's not here. Is Keith on? Did Keith get in? Yep, he's okay, here. Perfect. Uh, Keith, present at all four? Yes. Mal Missy, present at all four? Yes, and did you see Lynn in the chat? I didn't, but I'm, I will get in there in a second. Sorry, I have to toggle between two screens. That's and okay. It's one thing, one cluster. Uh, Bill, present at all four? Yes. Um, Olivia, did I do you? Olivia yep. present at the first three, not the 29th. Yes. Okay, good. You're all set, Bob. And you got Lynn? I do, yes. Yes, for the, she said yes. yes. <laughs> I'm all set. Go ahead. All right. Let me just. Uh, Shelly, it's your turn again. Hi. Uh, so I didn't have a monthly update for you, nothing formal this month, um, but I did share the expense reports with you all. There's no concerns um, from my end. You know, things are tracking as they should be at this point. But if you have any specific questions about either the school choice or the general fund expense report, I'll take them. Um, the one thing I will note on the school choice is we have requested our reimbursement through the four from the four towns. Um, through the Municipal Cares Act. So some of those expenses that you see on the school choice report, as we get our reimbursement, those numbers will drop because we'll put funds back into those accounts that we use to pay for COVID expenditures. Um, and then the warrant total uh, was just over 2 million. So there were 17 warrants reviewed and signed electronically since last meeting, totaling $2,076,625.84. And I, I signed them in person. I always forget that you guys don't sign electronically. Sorry, Bob signed them in person. Thank you for correcting. I have a tough time with computers. I don't need to have to sign something on the computer. So does anybody have any questions for Shelly? Okay, um, next we have public comment. Um, we got S Scott Dredge's we got a few of them tonight, and and Scott, you could start anytime you like. Scott, you're on mute. Are you unmuted? Yeah, thank you. I'll start first with the uh, FRSU 38 CPAC. Dear Frontier School Committee, I'm writing you. Is he frozen? Scott, I think you're frozen if you can hear me. S 
Scott. I'll text them. I just sent them a text. How about, how about if we come back to Scott for public comment and we'll continue? Is that a good idea? Livy, is your daughter around tonight? Uh, she should be on. Okay. I don't I, I don't have the, up the stairs. I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want to give you I mean Andy, you want to give your report? Sure. Okay. So um, since we last met, Student Council organized a video pep rally to garner support for the girls' basketball game last Tuesday, no, last Thursday, the boys' basketball game that was supposed to be today, and the hockey game that was um, Saturday. We were able to get videos from almost all the sports captains just sort of getting everyone excited for games, even though. Fans aren't really allowed at those. And um, also, Student Council is looking to work with the Interact Club to do a bigger community service drive sort of thing for the families in our area as well who may have been hit really hard um, throughout this winter. And we're looking to try and support them. And we're going to work with our two clubs on that. I'm sorry, I've been I've been doing a little texting here. So does anybody have any questions? Like we all say, Thank keep you. up keep up the good work. Yay. Scott, are you back on? Okay. I think Scott's ha Scott's having yeah. problems with his I'm back on. Okay, Scott, go ahead. Right. I'll let you go. I have absolutely no idea how much you you guys um, heard of me reading the CPAC statement, but I was uh, I was reading away over here, and uh, thank you for your text, everyone. <laughs> yeah, can you you want to start from the beginning? Because I think we only got into the first sentence of CPAC. Sure. Okay, this is from the CPAC, um, FRSU 38 CPAC. Dear Frontier School Committee, I'm writing to you on behalf of the Frontier Regional Union 38 Special Education Parent Advisory Council. We've been really proud of the spotlight on anti-racism and equity within this district. The hard work that administrators and staff have put in has not gone unnoticed. We all know that this is ongoing work and the steps taken this year are just the beginning. It has taken many generations to embed biases in our society and will take many generations to remove them. As this work continues, we would like you to consider other areas of equity beyond race, in particular disabilities. As curriculums are revamped, policies are amended and professional development is being provided, we ask that you include many different populations, including the disabled community, in these changes. Following the civil rights movement of the 1960s, there were subsequent equity movements for other marginalized populations. As the saying goes, history repeats itself and subsequent movements for equity are likely to occur in the coming years. Instead of setting up subcommittees for each group, it would be more efficient to have an outside agency conduct a comprehensive equity audit. These recommendations from this review could be used to steer the district's equity efforts with an anticipatory approach instead of a reactionary one. The goal of secondary education is to prepare teens for adulthood, considering the fact that 26% of Americans have a disability. Our community would be amiss sending our students off into adulthood without preparing them to understand and value one fourth of the population. Thank you for your time. Signed, Holly Johnson, AJ Saron, Carrie Thurlow, and Crystal Brown. 
Okay, the next uh, comment I have is from Lou Vincent. Dear school committee members, thank you for thank you all for your care and service to our community. As we, the global and local community, have been experiencing the double pandemic of COVID-19 and the urgent need for racial justice, I want to reflect back on our school district's promises of the commitment to become an anti-racist and equitable community. Superintendent Modesto wrote in a letter signed by many town officials, some of them yourselves, on June 12, 2020, uh, and I quote the following, the district commits to ongoing social justice training and growth. We acknowledge the systemic racism that exists in our society's policies and institutions. We recognize that prevailing homogeneity, homogeneity in our district leadership team has left out the voices and experiences of our community oh. members of color and failed to provide support and acknowledgement of the stress, grief, and trauma that people of color are living with because of recent events, as well as throughout our nation's racist history. We acknowledge these mistakes and omissions and want to express our commitment to learning, growing, and becoming an actively anti-racist community. We understand that the only way to undo racism in our society is to consistently identify, describe, and dismantle the systemic racism embedded within it. We pledge to support anti-racism policies through action and seek transform transformative change in our system." End quote. In addition, more than 300 Frontier alumni created and signed a letter stating these items to address. And this is the following. When you know better, you have a responsibility to do better. As a country and a community, it's imperative that we rethink the way that we teach our children and young people about history and their relationship to it. That's why we have seven main suggestions that we urge you to consider when thinking about how we can begin to teach students about race and racism in the United States. One, develop and adopt a race and racism in the US course and make it a requirement for all juniors and seniors. Two, assign summer reading that tackles issues re related to race and racism and center the voices and work of black authors. Three, do school-wide screenings of films and documentaries that discuss what racism looks like in America today. For example, mass incarceration, police br brutality, the war on drugs, etc. cetera. Four, bring in outside trainers or facilitators to hold workshops by grade uh, to discuss bias, privilege, and racism. Five, adopt a zero tolerance policy for slurs and hate speech, including racial slurs and symbols, verbal, written, graffiti, or worn on clothing. Six, establish tangible support systems that help to foster a safe, inclusive, and healing environment for students of color. Seven, prioritize diversity and hire more people of color at Frontier. The FRS school district responded by creating a district-wide equity and anti-racism task force composed of dedicated and caring people, almost entirely volunteer intent on shifting the climate of FRS from one of silent complicity with racism to one of courage, care, and long overdue anti-racism. I applaud this. Great strides have been made in some areas and in some locales. The Deerfield Elementary School immediately in September adopted a teacher-created mandatory eight-week professional development program and are working in concert with their curriculum court director, Kim McCarthy, and the Collaborative for Educational Services to train teachers how to audit their own curriculum. This shows real support from their admin Tina Jem, as well as curriculum director and outside agency support. Meanwhile, at FRS, I, as a parent to children of color, am not seeing these commitments being addressed with the energy, time commitment, consistency, and weight they deserve. Attempts at anti-racism and equity seem scattered and inconsistent. I hear the need for more support from staff who long for backing to make curriculum changes and help facing backlash from families who find race to be a political issue. Numerous racist occurrences have happened this year, which my children have encountered in some form, leaving them wondering, when will the next racist occurrence happen? As the response to educating at these junctures seems inadequate, inconsistent, and non-systemic at best. There is no statement of curricular changes. Black history is US history, which should be integrated into all curriculum and a foundational part of US history. And yet my children's history is a vacant hole in the curriculum, leaving our family erased and many white families left perpetuating an inaccurate and harmful narrative of our country. I believe the staff and faculty at FRS need the support of outside resources, as well as the support of their administrative community. Black Lives Matter imagery on campus or in virtual classrooms has been deemed somehow problematic, even though it's proudly displayed at Northampton and Amherst High School. Do Black Lives Matter at Frontier? I suggest that, that the Frontier Union School District hire an outside agency chosen by the Anti-Racist and Equity Task Force to complete a broad spectrum equity audit. This audit and assessment should include curriculum, professional development, hiring practices, administrative practices, school culture, and more. Additionally, I propose that the FRSU 38 hire a diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator 
who works with faculty, staff, admin, students, and families to help EPRAS transition and continue to grow into the anti-racist and equitable school it hopes to be. Sincerely, Lou Vincent, parent of, eighth, of an FRS eighth grader. Uh, the next public comment is from Megan Raylan. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication to our school com communities during this challenging past year. I see and appreciate the thoughtfulness, care, and courage this district has shown in attending to the health and safety of our communities while working to build anti-racism efforts within our schools. I want to say a specific thank you to the Deerfield Elementary School teachers and administrators for supporting anti-racism efforts at DES. Specifically, I want to acknowledge Principal Jem, Kim McCarthy, Jennifer Smith, and the countless other educators that are engaging in critical and necessary changes to curriculum and to their teaching practices that honor a more accurate, inclusive history of this country and that highlight diverse perspectives. As a parent, I see the differences in what my kids are learning, discussing, and watching. In order to build on the excellent changes that have already happened and to con continue to assess effective next steps, I urge the district leadership and school committee to hire an outside entity to conduct a broad spectrum, comprehensive diversity, and equity inclusion audit of the district. This audit could provide critical direction in supporting anti-racism efforts in regards to hiring practices, professional development, curriculum changes, family engagement, etc. I also urge the district to hire a full-time inclusion officer to support adherence to the recommendations that such an audit could generate and to provide ongoing guidance and support to district administrators, educators, and families as we continue the work of creating more just school communities. While both of these suggestions require significant investment on the part of the district, I believe that both of these proposals would ensure that an anti-racism uh, effort is happening in, in effective, planful, and consistent ways across the Frontier District. I am hopeful that we can continue to come together as a community to address these dual realities of a global pandemic and the legacy and ongoing harms of systemic racism. I'm eager to support these efforts in any way I can. With gratitude, Megan Whelan. The next public comment I have here is from Lisa Moore. I would like to have anti-racism curriculum for the students to be mandatory. In addition, the teachers should have training to support the students to improve their understanding. Signed, Lisa Moore. The next uh, public comment is from Pia Furkan. My name is Pia Furkan. I am a member of the town of South Deerfield. I want to acknowledge and thank the hard work of the many people who have been working hard to ensure members of school community are taken care of in every way possible. Text him quick so he doesn't keep reading. <laughs> that was very nice of you, Keith. Judy, does it show that he's still on? Yeah, he must be reading away. He probably is. So, I mean, um, Mr. Chairman, you know, the public comment only kind of makes sense if we address the comments and s to some extent. Um, I'll leave that up to the people that the com that the comments were addressed to, but. The, the thing that I'm always concerned about is, you know, when there are factual assertions made in public letters, I, I, I just always would like them addressed to, because if they're not addressed, then they're assumed to be true. So, um, so there was a whole bunch in there. There was a bunch of factual assertions that I heard, and I just wanted to hopefully hear whether that, those were accurate or not. Well, we have, Scott, are you back with us, Scott? Yes, I am. You want to, I'm not yep. sure, that the last one, I'm not sure if it was a short one, it was a long no. one. Uh, Pia, I have one more paragraph to go from Pia's statement. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I'll, I'll finish up here. I cannot begin to emphasize enough the importance of focusing on anti-racism anti work. Our community is not immune to racism. I have experienced it firsthand many times within my own town. Our schools can do better to prevent the traumas of racism. The children of Frontier and the members of this community 
deserve better. I'm imploring you to hire an outside group to address the needs of anti-racism work that needs to be done at Frontier. Sincerely, Bia Furkan. The next one is from Richie Allium. First, I want to again express my utmost gratitude at all the work you have been doing during the seemingly impossible school year. This year, my children have been able to thrive in this environment, and that has everything to do with the amazing efforts of the teachers, custodial staff, administrative staff, their principal, their superintendent, the members of the boards of health, school committees, and this amazing community where we call home. This has been a very challenging year in so many ways, and I, for my part, want you to know that your effort has not gone unnoticed. In a few short years, my children will be entering Frontier. While this is sometimes a source of anxiety, as a parent, I was grateful to hear about the district's effort to address systemic racism with the creation of the Anti-Racist and Equity Committee. I was very inspired to hear that the district was taking a long, hard look at curriculum, hiring practices, professional development in regards to anti-racism and equity. As a white person with white children, I need the support of the schools to help teach my children about the history of racism in our country, as well as the history of resistance to racism, so they can understand how we arrive at this moment, so they can have agency to be part of the solution. This shouldn't be a political issue. Racism harms everyone. I hope that this important work will continue to grow and create a school culture where everyone feels welcome. It takes all of us and then some. This is ongoing work. With that in mind, our district would gain so much from an outside perspective. I'm writing today to ask that the district consider having a third party consultant to conduct a broad spectrum, comprehensive diversity, equity, inclusion audit of our district in regards to hiring practices, curriculum development, and professional development. We have an opportunity to help create a more just anti-racist society. It is my hope that we don't miss it. This work can be and seem daunting, and it is hard sometimes to see the progress that's being made. But instead of throwing up our arms in frustration, I'm hoping we can roll up our sleeves and get to work. Please know that you're in my thoughts and my heart. I'm also grateful for the service you have given to our community. And I look forward to working together for a more just and equitable world. In closing, I would like to quote James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. With peace and gratitude, Richie Allium. And one more from Bill Henson. I just wanted to say how excited I am to learn that Frontier is doing some anti-racism education with its students. I know that it can be difficult when one is confronted with an alternative perspective that might not be as whitewashed as is often taught, but I believe that is absolutely critical to the very survival of our country and world for that matter, that we teach our children the good, the bad, and the ugly about our past so we can work towards that more perfect union that we say we desire. Though we have lofty and truly, truly worthy goals, our actions as a nation have not always been pretty. And we need to be honest about that with ourselves and our kids. It helps us be humble and appreciate each other. Thank you for having the courage to support anti-racism education in our community. Sincerely, Bill Henson. And I believe Emily Krems wanted to. Yeah, um, yeah. so that's all Thank I have you. for public comment. Thank you, Scott. No problem. Hey, Scott, uh, I just sent you one. I think Jen Smith had, uh, submitted one for to be read to I don't know if it got to you it did not why don't we have um Emily go and then I'll, I'll wait for yours to pop up there it is Emily you on I am yes hi can you hear me yep okay I'm going to be reading two letters. One letter is from the Deerfield Inclusion Group, and the second letter is from myself individually. To the members of the Frontier Regional School Committee, Frontier Administrators, and school community, we, the undersigned members of the Deerfield Inclusion Group, recognize that administrators, teachers, school staff, families, and school committee members have faced and continue to face, without a doubt, the most challenging school year ever as we navigate the pandemic. We understand that an unimaginable amount of time, energy, and collaboration has been required to face this challenge. The Deerfield Inclusion Group is a growing coalition of families, educators, and community members committed to making our community more equitable, equitable and inclusive. 
We commend the fact that the district has begun to address systemic racism by creating the Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force, teaching Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, as well as Superintendent Darius Modesto and Principal George Lunides' announcing to the school community the administration's anti-racist stance. These initial steps are appreciated, but there is much more work to be done in order to truly become an anti-racist school. The Deerfield Inclusion Group makes the following recommendations. That an outside agent entity performs an equity audit to assess current strengths and weaknesses at Frontier and to provide specific recommendations to address deficiencies in hiring practices, hiring practices, curriculum, school culture and climate, and more. That the district hires a diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator to guide the ongoing work of creating a welcoming and inclusive school for all. This individual would have the specific credentials and training necessary to facilitate the ongoing work towards making the FRSU community more equitable. This goal was also identified by the Policy and Procedures Subcommittee of the Frontier Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force and endorsed by Superintendent Modesto and the entire FRSU administration. And third, that required U.S. history courses comprehensively include all of the racial and cultural narratives of this country. These narratives should be incorporated into all aspects of the middle and high school curriculum. We believe that these specific action steps will promote, promote lasting substantive change and move closer toward our shared goal of an inclusive, high quality education for all of our students. Additionally, they align with the suggestions outlined with the, uh, within the alumni letter sent to the district last summer. These recommendations may, will require commitment, creativity, and capital to implement, yet we believe they represent a worthy long-term investment in the future citizens of our world. This letter is signed by myself, Emily Krems, Erica Boyd-Jacob, Suzanne Ryan, Lou Vincent, Pia Furkan, Richie Allium, Megan Rellin, Jennifer Smith, Susanna Lawler, Ruth Konigsbauer, Kimberly Snyder, Asia Cerrone, Lisa Middens, Lori Clark, Ann Curtis, Leila Hazen, Sean Durrett, Annalie wolf Coley, and Sarah Allium. <clears throat> and then I have a letter from myself. Dear school committee members and Frontier administrators, my name is Emily Krems and I'm the parent of an eighth grader at Frontier, co-chair of the Policy and Procedures Subcommittee of the Frontier Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force, a public school educator and an individual who cares deeply about the education of all of our children. When I was younger and attended middle school and high school, I didn't realize then, but I realize now, huge pieces of the history of this country, of the people that make up this country, were not taught and were not talked about. I grew up knowing, I grew up not knowing what really happened in this country. Once I became aware and as, as an adult, I embarked on a lifelong and even in some ways a soul searching journey to educate myself and do better as a white person in this society. I knew that as last summer's alumni letter beautifully phrased it, quote, when you know better, you have a responsibility to do better, end quote. I was disheartened to learn that the over 300 alumni that wrote to the district last summer had a similar story to my story from school days, saying about Frontier that, quote, we all believe that critical events, time periods, and stories, specifically those related to the enslavement of African Americans, the Reconstruction Era, Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Movement, were skimmed over or completely absent from the curriculum taught during our middle and high school careers, end quote. And that's why I'm here reading this letter to you tonight, because right now we, you, have an opportunity to change how all of our children are being taught, what all of our children are being taught, so that my child, who is a person of color, and all children in the school can benefit by becoming more caring and active citizens who know what the words equity, inclusion, racism, and anti-racism mean, who know the real history of this country as well as present day challenges people of color face in this country and can then make informed choices in their lives and in society. I would like to publicly commend the eighth grade teachers who have done the right thing and incorporated African American history into their English and history classes through the teaching of Stamped. They have been teaching accurate historical information and challenging our kids to grapple with the facts of how this country was built. My hope is that more teachers will teach the history that is all of our history but isn't taught. And I hope that the school committee members and frontier administration will not only encourage this type of teaching throughout the school, but provide all the necessary professional development and tools to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Bob, 
uh, it's Scott again. I, I did I did get that email from Missy. Thank you, Missy. Um, I'll read this last statement. This statement is from Jen Smith, parent, teacher, and community member of DIG. Dear Mr. Halla and the other Frontier School Committee members, as we cross into the second half of this extraordinary year, it's time to reflect on the goals set out by the mission of the FRS District in Union 38. After receiving a letter from over 200 alumni, the administration set the schools on a bold path to become an anti-racist school. Much has been started. Union 38, including all elementary schools, had 10 weeks of in-depth professional development for teachers to learn a more accurate history of the United States and reflect on systemic racism in our country and schools, as well as how our white privilege keeps us from facing the racism in our lives. The elementary schools are embarking on learning to audit their own curriculum so that they can continue to revise and develop anti-racist teaching practices. To continue to assess where we are, we can look at the seven suggested items from the alumni letter specifically for Frontier to address. One, develop or adopt a race and racism in the US course and make it a requirement for all juniors and seniors. Two, assign summer reading that tackles issues that uh, are related to race and racism and centers the voices and work of black authors. Three, do school-wide screenings of films and documentaries that discuss what racism looks like in America today. Four, bring in outside trainers or facilitators to hold workshops by grade to discuss bias, privilege, and racism. Five, adopt a zero tolerance policy for slurs and hate speech, including racial slurs and symbols. Six, establish tangible support systems that help to foster safe, inclusive, and healing environments for students of color. And seven, prioritize diversity and hire more people of color at Frontier. A few of these have begun to be addressed. Book lists are being revised and implemented. A school wide screening of a documentary was shown, though without proper facilitation, it might have caused more harm to our student body than good. With so many items not yet addressed, I asked the school committee to take steps to hire an outside entity to conduct a broad spectrum, comprehensive diversity and equity and inclusion audit of the district. This audit would look at procedures at all levels, including curriculum, hiring practices, professional development, et cetera. In addition, there should be a diversity officer hired for the district who is trained in diversity and equity and inclusion, who would hire, and who would hire support and advise administration be a li liaison to parents and provide restorative practices to students. Hiring this person is in fact, one of the goals of the Frontier Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force as endorsed by the superintendent, Mr. Modesto. With such great steps happening in some parts of the district, we must have consistency across the district. While some teachers at Frontier are working hard in isolation to create anti-racist classrooms, we must support them by having mandatory professional development for all staff at Frontier, providing paid time for curriculum development across all areas and by having clear and decisive messages from administration and through school policy that denounces hate speech, including racial slurs and symbols. Thank you for listening and for making space each month to hear about the anti-racism work that teachers are championing in their classrooms. As written in the alumni letter, when you know better, you have the responsibility to do better. Thank you, Jennifer Smith. Thanks, thank you, Scott. I, I wanna thank everybody for the public comment tonight. Um, we do have an update. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm on to give public comment as well. Okay. Were you were you scheduled or yes. okay. well I requested the meeting invite. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Hello everyone. Um I, I'm a parent of a Frontier student. I learned from discussions at another public meeting that there's no plan in place in the district for a return to full-time in-person learning once educators are vaccine eligible. The comments I heard left me with considerable doubt that an effort is being made to get our kids back full-time this school year. All eyes have been on a vaccine and it is thankfully nearly here for educators. It's time to start a plan for a return to full-time in-person learning. As a parent, I've had an understanding that this was the goal, to get the schools as safe as they can be for teachers, which will allow us to get our kids back in school. Families have held on by a thread for almost a year now. I'm looking for some assurance that the district is working to get our kids back. I've heard the slogan, only when it's safe. It is safe. There have been limited cases at Frontier and district schools more generally, and there have been no, no, there's been no known in-school spread. 
there are masking, social dis distancing, and other safety protocols in place. There is a wonderful dis district staff doing an excellent job with contact tracing and very capable boards of health tracking cases in the broader community. There is antigen testing and there will soon be pool testing. And most critically, there is a vaccine for educators just around the corner. Once the teachers are vaccine eligible, the risk to teachers from being at the school will be extremely low, not nearly significant enough to continue to deprive children of in-person schooling and to subject them to further isolation from their peers. I'm urging this committee and the administration to plan for a full in-person return once the vaccine is available to teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Is there any other um, buddy on that wants to do public comment? Okay. So we're gonna have a, we have an update on anti-racism and equality committee update. And I think I saw, a man, was it Amanda? Are you back back yeah. on? Yes, are you I am. Are you going to do the update for us? I am. I'm, we're switching things up this time. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda. I'm an alumni of Sunderland Elementary back in, I'm not really sure when, um, and Frontier 2013. So I'm back helping work with the district on issues of anti-racism and equity, and I'm providing the update. I'm the, I'm the face of the update this evening. Um, there's a lot going on, so if you will bear with me through it all, I'll provide kind of the concrete points and then um, give, give some of my kind of recommendations and opinions as someone who's doing this work with very closely with the district just to make sure that we're seeing this through and then there's time for questions comments and concerns if applicable okay so consolidate it all bear with me um so black history month is this this month um so there was a resource list that was sent out to all schools and there've been a lot of responses from elementary school teachers who are very excited to bring this work into the classroom and are using this resource guide as a roadmap of how to do that. The uh, Anti-Racism and Equity School Culture Committee um, has had two open discussions with peer leadership groups. There've been about 30 participants each time. And this feedback from students has been overwhelmingly positive. As someone who has been present for some of those discussions, it's been really incredible seeing the young people just engage with, with these issues and with these topics. Um, there will be an unveiling of the new logo at the end of February. For elementary professional development, to skip over to the elementary side of things, um, the elementary schools are working with myself and two other anti-racism and education consultants this term. Um, they are focusing on revamping curriculum. Um, so instead of outsourcing audits of curricula to check for you know, representation, diversity. Um, we are doing that in-house and learning. We're learning how to fish, if you will. And so the idea is using a bunch of tools that we have collected, um, particularly this uh, culturally responsive curriculum scorecard um, from NYU that was developed. We are really making sure that everyone has the tools necessary to go through their curriculum and to see for themselves disparities in representation, inaccuracies in character portrayal, inaccuracies in history, for example. Um, and then the high school professional development will be coming back March 3rd. There's been a bit of a break. Um, 
everyone is reading is ev everyone is reading is everyone really equal um, by Robin D'Angelo and Oslem uh, Sensoy. There are workshops that are being done through Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. Um, the Policy and Procedure Anti-Racism Committee um, found that they, or they, I should say they put out a survey um, on what are the policies and procedures around microaggressions and incidences of racism. And the results were conclusive and that there is a definitive lack of consistency and a lack of familiarity with what to do when incidences of racism, microaggressions, whatever that may be, happen. 46% of survey respondents were not familiar with procedures that the admin follows when a racist incident occurs. 47% of respondents said they were unsure of how consistent the procedures among staff in the building are. And in addition, 25% more said that they are not at all consistent. There's not a consistent application with procedures um, across staff in the building. So that is in indicative of a, of a broader problem that needs to be addressed and communicated out. Um, in terms of curriculum, the high school is offering African American studies next year. Um, I believe is an elective and the peer leadership group will officially be a class called media activism and social change, also an elective. Um, as part of that class, the, there is hope that elementary school visits will be a part of that curriculum. Um, so that's a lot, <laughs> that, is, that is a lot of updates and that's a lot of really powerful work that's happening and a lot of movement that's happening. And it's a, it feels like a lot because it is a lot. My perspective as someone who has now had the privilege of not, not only going to this district, um, for my entire, my entire uh, elementary and secondary career, but my perspective as someone who has now worked with the district for months and months is that there is change happening, but it feels very superficial. And that is harsh, but it's true. For example, the African-American studies class is an elective, but African-American history is the history of this country. So if we're going to offer it as an elective, how are we changing the required history courses to ensure that all students who go through this school have access to this understanding that black history is US history? There's clear need for more PD on identifying microaggressions, but not only that, on understanding what the policy and procedures are and clearly communicating that. There is, as I kind of ascertained from listening to all those public comments, there's a clear need for open communication with various stakeholders inside and outside of the school community. There are all of these parents who do not know what is being done, who do not know what is happening. And there is good work to be done, but if they're in the dark, that is, half of the stakeholders who don't know what's happening. And that's an issue. So there needs to be more communication, just more clarity. Um, and I think right now, from my perspective, it feels that Frontier is a school with anti-racist classrooms. And how is this going to be changed? How can we transition from individual teachers and individual classrooms doing this work 
to making this systematic. Everyone is doing this. Everyone is looking at their curriculum. Everyone is reviewing their assessments. Everyone is understanding the policies that are going on. That is what anti-racism is. It is not simply electives and it's not simply mascot changes. It is asking what are our priorities as a district and ensuring that we are following through. And that is difficult and we are starting to do that work, but we've just gotten to the, we've just gotten to the starting line. As much as we've done and as difficult as it's been, this is just the starting line. The systematic changes that occur after all of you have left school committee, after I am long gone from working with this district, that is what we have to be thinking about. And so I would really like to see a clear picture of what is our plan over the next couple of years and how are we going to get there? Because I think unlike the elementary school, it takes longer to audit curricula at the secondary level. So what is our five-year plan say? And each year, how do we get closer to doing that? How do we get closer to those recommendations and that alumni letter that I was a part of writing? Because I was a student of color in this district and it was the most dehumanizing experience, unfortunately. To be a student of color in this school district was to be told constantly that even if you are the best, you are not enough. And that is unacceptable. And I never want anyone to ever have to experience that again. So what are we going to do to ensure that, to enshrine that in the very DNA of our school? How are we going to make these changes so that no student of color ever feels like they are lesser? Okay, I'm done. Thanks, Amanda. Anybody have any questions for Amanda? Missy? That, that was an amazing update. That was Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Missy, you got a question? I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, so first off, I, you know, I think that there's certainly some amazing work that you guys are doing, and I, you know, applaud the the goals that, um, you know, I think we should all be working towards getting to that space, whether it's in this district or our personal lives. But um, uh, I, I have a a lot of themes in these public comments have been about bringing in somebody who will do some sort of comprehensive audit. Mm -hmm. and so this is kind of a logistical question of, do you, are you aware of an entity that will do that kind of comprehensive audit across all of those aspects of the school from curriculum to hiring practices to policy and professional development? Do you know of such a, an organization who, who does that? Yes. But I think <laughs> that's expensive. Um, I skipped out of <laughs> I skipped out of the the Waitley School Committee meeting as soon as they started talking budget. But I think realistically, doing all of those things at once is well. You all know better than me. Probably unlikely. <laughs> being being realistic and being honest and being transparent. And so I think focusing on performing, who can perform a curriculum audit? How can we make sure some of that is being done in-house? So we're teaching people not only to, not only that there are issues in their curriculum, but teaching them how to fish, teaching them how to spot these weaknesses in their own curriculum. And I think, so I think it's taking this, we need an assessment and breaking it down so that it's being implemented piece by piece. Does that make sense? So because first, first realistically, we have to do it piece by piece. That exactly. It would be nice to do it all at once, but. Yeah. If, yes, exactly. So we're not, what I'm saying is not that we are going to sell ourselves short. What I'm saying is that is not that we are going to only commit halfway. What I'm saying is that this is a forever commitment. And so the first part of that is 
explicitly going to be this piece. Um, and so say that's curriculum, because I've, again, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of young people at Frontier, and they've been saying, you know, I'm not seeing these changes. I'm not seeing any curriculum update. That is kind of the most tangible piece. So saying this is what we are going to focus on in this next year, for example, over the summer, teachers are auditing their curriculum. We're having someone outside, an outside hire. And there are, there are plenty of um, organizations that do that, particularly with UMass. Um, so I'm happy to provide more specifics on that front. Um, Yes. Did that answer your question, Missy? I'm really good at rambling. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I mean, I kind of basically, right, this is, this is the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And exactly. this may be the first step that has the most view for folks is to, to review the curriculum, even though the call and the, the journey will eventually maybe get us to a space where we are looking at all, all of those aspects. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Someone... I have, oh, go ahead. Someone raised their hand, but I have no idea. Uh, yeah, that was me, uh, that oh. Damien um, I just want to commend your update too, and I, I do truly hope that we can get to a point, you know, hopefully sooner than later that we can meet a lot of these goals. I think this is a, you know, a very important topic. Um, one question I, I do have, maybe this Sarah Mitchell can um, chime in on this one. One of the uh, comments you had made was the um, African American history course is being uh, chosen as an elective at this point. Uh, are we somewhat bound by state requirements of what what courses have to be considered, you know, given? And then there's only so many choices that that really fall into being an elective without making it a required course. And although it is part of our U.S. history, how do we incorporate a course? I don't know if that's, that's a separate course that probably has state mandates that we have to follow to make required courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question, Damien. And Amanda, thanks so much for your update. I really appreciate hearing your voice. Um, so we, some things to talk about. Um, this is a long process. We're, we're not in it for the short run. Um, that course um, that's being developed um, is being offered as an elective, but there's some, been some pretty substantial changes that have happened recently to the social studies frameworks for Massachusetts. Um, and the social studies department has been working on adopting those changes um, the last couple of years. Um, it's, it's a pretty lengthy process. Um, a lot of the frameworks which we've discussed um, at these meetings are moving to um, pieces that involve a lot more skills and the content has changed radically. Um, but yes, we are bound by standards um, and those standards are being um, updated and revised at the, the state and national level to include some of this work so that it gets incorporated into all of our courses and isn't just a standalone elective. The standalone elective would certainly address the needs, um, both the electives that you mentioned, Amanda, um, are certainly going to address the needs of a population of students that really want to dig more deeply and specifically into this work, um, but we are working to address it with all students. Um, and as I said, we really need to take a look at the long road here. Um, a lot of the professional development that we do and start, it's not just a one and done deal. Um, we've been working on assessment, that was a three-year process. Differentiation, that was a three-year process. And then in addition, we continue to include those professional development opportunities in future years so that we're never really ending something that's major and has started. Um, we've done some social justice work at Frontier historically. Um, since about 2016, we've offered a workshop here and there. Um, it's mostly been at the introductory level. And this year, we're really um, digging deep. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, we've done some PD this fall. Um, there are no PD Fridays during the winter, um, so we're starting up um, March 3rd or March, it's actually March 10th, but in March, um, we'll have three more workshops from um, the University of Massachusetts, 
and they'll be focused around having difficult conversations around race. And the primary focus and emphasis this year was really um, a self-examination approach, um, which is what UMass recommended to us before we really dive into curriculum. So curriculum's next. Um, we actually have a curriculum um, committee that's going to be meeting this spring to um, put out surveys to teachers, not just about anti-racism, because we are really looking at changing um, the format of our curriculum. We've been using a software tool for um, about 13 or 14 years. Um, it's time to take a look at that tool to see if it's still making meeting our needs. Um, but a big part of the curriculum will also be um, taking a look at the lenses, um, different lenses. One of those lenses will be the differentiation work that we've done. Another one will be the assessment work we've done. And the third um, lens that we'll look at it is the anti-racism and um, cultural relevance of the curriculum. Um, so that's all to come. Um, and I don't expect changes to happen overnight. Um, this situation wasn't created overnight and we really need to um, keep our eye on the prize and know that this is gonna be something that's going to take years and years to really um, make systemic change and lasting change, change that's really gonna um, last throughout the rest of my career um, and probably the careers of my successors. Thank you, Sarah. Who else has a question for Amanda? Keith, go for it. Oh, sorry, Phil. <laughs> See you. So just, you know, you, you were talking a little bit about um, that, that there are some metrics of success and that you could go into it a little bit. But, you know, and I wonder about this because how do, how do you how do you measure success when the when it's the journey towards success that is really what this is all about? Because you know, there's so many kids that no matter what you do at school, they go home to a racist, white supremacist friendly uh, you know environment. Um, that that there that that that's true in every if, if a community is large enough there will be families that that espouse those views and um so so yeah there's a, you know there's a sense from some of the people writing in or you know with comments that that the, the success is not fast enough um that it's not tangible enough some of, some of your comments seem to seem to be that Maybe that we could have, we we could have there could be a greater level of achievement right now, um, but uh, you know how do you get there? How do you measure it? How how do you know if it's that? I, I, I don't know. Um, co complex problems are so difficult to even know where to start. You were supposed to give me a softball. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um. Well, I think. Right, the it's not it's not either we are <laughs> we are or we are successful or we are not. Just like you've said, it's continuous growth. And I think, well, you asked like six questions there, so <laughs> let me start with one. <laughs> I think, firstly, yes, we have lots of people who let's say really love the confederate flag and really are far too comfortable using the n-word and i know that because i have been called it in this community plenty of times to in that case getting a young person who has that background to simply ask questions about their home environment you know, it can be as simple as what is race? It can be as simple as, is this really why the Civil War was fought? Asking those simple questions to start to break down the assumptions because the assumed, it is assumed that your home environment, in your home environment, that the people who are older than you are always right. Forming cracks in that assumptions and those understandings, that's a win. Just asking one question, planting one seed, that is a win. And so that what happens with school is school needs to be teaching young people, students to be critical, to say, 
this is what the textbook is showing us. What is it not showing us? Whose voices are missing? Who wrote this textbook? What was their motivation? Who, was, who did not play a part in writing this textbook? What resources from outside can we bring in to provide a different perspective? Is what we are learning true? That is what history is. I had to leave for college in order to understand that. I had to concentrate in a field of study that was literally racism in America to begin to ask these questions. But you don't have to wait until you are off in some university somewhere to ask these questions. Those questions, can you can start asking those at any age. And so that is one way to measure success. To Are students asking questions? Are they questioning the idea that what I'm telling you is right simply because I'm an authority? That's powerful. The second is, for example, in policy and procedures, they had a survey that said, almost 50% of teachers surveyed had no idea what the policy or procedure was regarding microaggression. You, we can very tangibly change that needle, move that needle by making it clear and communicating clearly, this is what we do when this happens. Here are the people who we communicate with. This is the chain reaction that we follow. There, it's different for dis different aspects of this multifaceted problem. We have different responses and we have different measures of success. I think the biggest determinant is of success for me is if we all were gone tomorrow and new people came and filled our shoes, would they know, would they be able to pick up where we left off? Or because this, we did not implement this systemically enough, would they simply revert back to the status quo, which I can attest to is harming students? Did that answer your question, any of them? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it said, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> said, further light, said further light on, you know, the whole concept of long time frames and, you know, a. Uh, 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 a, a multi-year, multi-generational struggle to just keep moving the needle in the right direction. So, I, but uh, you know, it's 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 no wonder that there is such a difference of opinion as to the effectiveness of what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, because this topic lends itself to dif differences of opinion mm -hmm. in all respects. So, yeah, good luck, good luck. Um, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad you, the headwinds that we as a culture have been facing in the past year in this topic, particularly, are astounding. And to, to make progress during this time, to make any progress, you know, I mean, I, I'm proud that there were no frontier graduates in, in that yet that have been named as, uh, you know, trying to overthrow the government on January 6th. But I think that's a step forward. We should all be proud of that. Um, but, you know, uh, so, but. You know, so good. Uh, Keith, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so, Amanda, thank you for the update. And and, and I, I want to compliment everybody because, again, this is one that in remote teaching and in a, a pandemic when people have to relearn everything, it could have easily been, you know what, this is not the time. We can't do this. We're going to drop this. So I appreciate everybody um, uh, administratively, the teachers tackling this. Um, but it's, I want to turn a little bit away from uh, the administrative level and then really talk like grassroots immediate changes, because I really do. I, I really do feel that some immediate changes can happen at the classroom level, immediate pivots. And, and because I'm involved in this right now, I teach English. Um, I've taken this work on for the last couple of years. I'm teaching one of my classes in British literature. Right. This, the, the traditional thing is it's dead white men. Right. And it doesn't get better, whiter, and maler than, than British literature. So how do we tackle this? And, and it's been a, an interesting um, journey. And immediately, I've changed assignments. I've changed supplemental readings. I've changed um, the, the, the films that they would watch. I've expanded the readings. I've, I've done some immediate changes. And I know there are teachers doing that. But I don't think anybody in this room knows exactly what's going on at the ground level. So what I asked this at the Sun Own Elementary one. Um, I think it's easier in English, social studies, and the arts. It's probably much, much more difficult in math and science. But what are some of the media? I'd love to hear later on down the road, maybe May, June, 
what some teachers are doing specific. I'd love to have teachers come to a meeting and just say some of the immediate changes they're making in classes, some of the things they're doing right away. Um, a couple of those letters, people talked about the work that they're doing in isolation. And that's what it feels like sometimes in a classroom. You're kind of working on your own, you're working with your students, but nobody really knows what you're doing. So I'd like to see those grassroots changes. I'd like to hear from the people doing it. And then, you know, a lot of times they, I've, I've gotten to a point now with me that I've kind of reached this point that now I want to reach out for help. And there's, there's, there's some directions I want to go in. And, I, and I'd like to see some of those teachers maybe appeal to Sarah, like, this is the way I, I, I need help in this professional development or, or these, uh, I'd like to take these graduate courses or something like that, where we're, we're looking at these people who are on the ground, doing the good work, doing the changes, and what, what are the next steps they need, that they can do immediate changes. So I would just like to advocate to see if we could have some teachers come out towards the end of the school year to just let us know what's really going on. That's a, that's a really good point. I think right now it is some teachers who are doing some work. It really needs to be all teachers doing this work. I, I was really fortunate in that I, I worked with the science department. Oh, boy. Time feels like a lie right now. So I think it was like a couple weeks ago, maybe two, maybe more, maybe less, um, where the entire school science department, you know, they asked me to come in and think about how can we implement anti-racism work? Because in English literature, for example, it's a little more clear cut in social studies and history. It's a little more clear cut. How can we do this with science? And it can start with the simple understanding that race is not biological. Race is something that we made up completely. And so that getting the science department familiar with that language and those concepts, they didn't know where to go. And so they reached out for help. That is something that can immediately be done by all teachers. All teachers can look and say, I'm going to change, you know, this unit, for example. I'm going to incorporate this statistics lesson. I'm going to um, highlight this mathematician. That is something that every teacher can do. And the problem is, though, right now it is not, it is not systemic. It's not holistic. Teachers are doing this in isolation. And that's not sustainable because this is, this is a pandemic. There are a billion other things to worry about. And if people are at capacity, and so there has to be room made, capacity made for teachers to be able to do this work, to feel supported in having, you know, feel supported to first identify areas of weakness in their curriculum, supported in bringing up these conversations in the classroom, supported in revamping it all and doing it again. So that's, that's really where the centralized support needs to come in, where we are mandating this. We are saying everyone has to look at their curriculum. And that's, that is the component that is missing. And this is, this is something that perhaps I overstep, but what, what are you all doing? You know, what are, what is the school committee doing to ensure that you are, you are able to ask the right questions when someone like me comes and presents you with all of these ideas? Uh, what work are you, in, you doing to ensure that your blind spots are minimized? Um, that you can really provide the necessary oversight. I'm not saying you're doing a bad job. I'm just saying we can all do better. Um, so that is also something to think about. How can we make this so that it is a whole culture change? Because that's what needs to happen. Culture has to change. Culture doesn't change in pockets. It changes as a community. And so that's what's really necessary here, if that makes sense. It does. I, I want to make sure that like a lot of times at the school committee, we get a real bird's eye view of what's going mm -hmm. on. But there, I think it'd be really important to just to hear from like what are some specific lessons that are happening. Like, I, I think that we'd really like to know what are what is some of the I'd like to I don't know if this goes Darius way just to 
invite some teachers in to just give us an idea of what they've been working on this year and how this is going? I, I yeah, I think I think we're saying two sides of the same thing. You know, we all of these teachers are doing these things, but they're not talking to each other because they're not sure who else is doing what. That is the communication part that is necessary for the kind of cultural, holistic approach to this. There needs to be explicit, strong communication, not only across teachers and from teachers to administration, but also to community members, also to parents. So that if, and you know, if there are angry parents or angry community members, then we're not addressing it as singular teachers. We are addressing it as a community of teachers, a community of ad- administrators saying, you know, these are our values and this is how we're approaching things. So it's our capacity together is greater than us doing this work individually. And that's what needs to happen. That is how this is sustainable during a pandemic, during, you know, political tensions during polarization. That is how this work is sustainable. Yeah. Missy, you have a you have a hand. Hi. <laughs> I do have a hand. Yeah. I actually have two um two things. One, uh Amanda, I think for you, and then the other one is on a totally different subject, but was brought up uh in public comment that I'd like to address. Um, so one is that you you kind of addressed this and it, it's come up that communication is kind of a, a weak spot. How do we make the group of folks who are doing this work both accessible so that people can kind of come to them more freely with with these concerns and and available so that they can kind of give these kind of updates outside of a school committee meeting. Um, not, I'm happy to have everybody here, but I, you know, I, I don't think this has to be the only time that people get updates mm-hmm. about this, uh, this work. Yeah, that's a great, wow, you jumped right into action mode. Okay, let me pivot here. Um, no, I'm stuff. I'm just, <laughs> no I, check them off. That's incredible. Okay, I think right off of the top of my head, um, putting, you know, people's contact information, people's uh, FRS, you know, emails on the website, for example. Questions, you know, come to these people. There needs to be kind of, uh, Sarah, you mentioned um, there's a curriculum committee at the secondary level, um, which which is great but they need to be talking to the curriculum people at the elementary level. And I think tying it all together and using the district anti-racism committee as a means to disseminate information, both across the middle school, high school and elementary schools, but also to disseminate information out into the community because there are community members who are part of this. it can be regularly updating, you know, parents and community members through newsletters, for example. Um, it's just making sure that the the contact is consistent, that people are accessible, that the objectives are clear. Um, and so, how those are a couple of ideas, feasibility. Maybe I'm not the best person to ask, but I think those are those are small things about, you know, the elementary team, for example, the elementary has a curriculum committee, a professional development committee. They are speaking to each other, but we need to make sure that they're also speaking to what's going, speaking to the committee at the high school and middle school level. So there's consistency across all grade bands. Um, And, you know, the community should be updated about this as well. Even if they can only know what is happening, if they want to be angry so that they have the opportunity to be angry, perhaps if only to have the opportunity to learn more or to just stay angry. Um, And because this, they they are half of, 
you know, young people spend a lot of time at school or at home on Zoom now um, and a lot of time at home with their families. So making sure that those that other 50 percent of their time, the people in that other 50 percent of their lives are also aware of what's going on. Is also essential. I don't think that really answered your question specifically. It's a start. I think I touched on broad, <laughs> broad scope of who needs to talk to whom and why. Well, it's a start. And I also think that that's how change from the school trickles into the community so that we can make sure that the values that we hold strongly as a school system also kind of trickle into the folks who end up in the school system. Exactly. Yeah. I think, uh, can Bob, can I jump in for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I think, you know, hearing a lot of what's going on tonight, there's a lot of misinformation out there and communication on what's being done. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people who are watching, especially instructors and teachers, um, who are going to be frustrated with what they heard tonight because I think there is a lot more coordination of what's going on. And I'm, uh, I'm a little frustrated that the way the information came out tonight did not come through the administration or through the leadership of our of our anti-racism group, um, you know, to, to have demands asked of school committee to ask, you know, for an additional position, to ask for an audit of the curriculum. I have two curriculum directors. Now Sarah, you know, who works for this school directly, does audits across the country, her connections across the country about, you know, systems that are, you know, larger than, than Western Mass for, for, for uh, Maya Springfield, um, that she's been part of audits too. And so she has a great deal of knowledge in this area about what does it take to take a curriculum and I think we need to have conversations about, about these demands before it turns into five or six or seven people deciding they have to come together to make a demand of school committee to make it happen when it didn't go through the natural system that we set up to have the conversation. And I think I'm also going to hear frustration that there is a lot of work happening at Frontier by teachers who are working together on things. And we have not done a good job. And you know, I'll raise my hand as being the leader of this district. We have not communicated out all that's happening. The amount of professional hours, double hours, our staff has dedicated to anti-racism work. And we've set it up in a way that it didn't start with curriculum. And I understand people are frustrated. They want to see students, um, the change happening in front of them, but it has to change with the instructor who's going to then go into curriculum. And that's how we've set it up. And so, you know, we have a lot more work to do. And I think I would, I'd like to you know, ask the school committees that we come back the administration comes back and shows an outline of everything that we've done so far um, and propose ahead. Naturally, that's coming in the month of April because I have to prepare the next year's calendar, which includes professional development. And also within that is going to include what does the professional development look like based on where did we get this year? This year, it was kind of a scramble putting it together. It was a scramble because of the COVID um, uh, limitations on us is a scramble because we also had 10 days at the beginning of the year with a quick impact where we threw a committee together. And I say we threw a committee together, but we are, I'm looking at our neighboring districts, we are taking big steps forward. Now, I understand, you know, it, it, it you, you, Amanda used the word superficial, but some of these small things have to get take, put in place in order for the whole system to kind of move as well. And so I mean, we're moving a barge. And, I, and I've kind of used this as a, the analogy, and it's it takes a lot to get it to change direction. I think we got a lot of good things in place. And I, I think we need to report back. Um, as Amanda said, I was actually talking with Kim McCarthy earlier today about we need to do a newsletter out to the entire community about what's happening at all levels. Because um, I don't think the updates that are happening at school committee is going to go to the, you know, at some of our school committee meetings, there's three or four people watching. There's more this evening, um, I think, due to the, 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 the nature of this topic and maybe the nature of the budget coming next. Um, but, you know, that's not, communication through school committee, you know, obviously getting you updated is important, but it's not getting out to everyone else. And we haven't done a, we haven't created a system to how do we do, do we do quarterly reports, a newsletter, easy reading, this is what everybody's doing. Um, and it shows the work that we're doing and work ahead um, and what we're planning on doing ahead. Because, um, you know, I, I think there's a, I mean, there's so much was said tonight and there's a lot of different things that were kind of said you kind of just left hanging out there, which I feel, you know, I want to wrap up each one of them, but um, that this is not the forum to do it, not this evening um, as well. But I think, you know, if we can come back next month with a, I don't know, Sarah, if you agree to that, of course, I'm going to say that you kind of have to agree to it now. 
Um, but, you know, kind of let's give a summary of where we're at, have a you know, snapshot. I think, um, you know, I, I know that we talk about teachers independently doing stuff, but they are doing stuff as groups as well. You talk about the science as an example, the science group is doing, the eighth grade is doing a, a whole thing. The social studies department is working together on stuff. So, I mean, that's just what I know off the top of my head, and I'm not ingrained with the day-to-day -day operations of Frontier anymore. So like, let's find out what the other things are. Let's share all that. Let's finally take a snapshot with the facts of what we have going on. And then at the same time, the next step after that, that's March, April will be developing the professional development calendar for next year, which is gonna drive all of our other work. Um, it's gonna drive this professional development. What's included? What kind of, what are we talking about when we talk about curriculum review? If curriculum review takes several years to do, how are we ordering that? How are we gonna line that up and in order to get the biggest bang for our buck up front, you know, and, and do all those things. So I started going down, so I've kind of been staying quiet and letting people kind of um, give their different views, but I think that's what we need to go next because it feels really different than we're at in a conversation. Uh, can I just respond really quickly? Yep. I appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Modesto. And I did come across as harsh. Um, because that's my nature. There is a lot of good work being done and that cannot be underemphasized. The fact that it is happening in cohorts like the social studies department, like eighth grade, uh, like the science department still speaks to a fragmentation that leads to miscommunication which leads to people believing that there is not work being done. And the, the, the simple fact that people think that there is not work being done is indicative of a problem, is indicative of a less systematized strategy than we want, than needs, than needs to happen in order to be truly sustained and that's all that's all <laughs> there is good work being done there's great work being done how about i'll put it like that and i'll stop being so harsh <laughs> that being said we can do better there's always work there's always room for improvement. Deficit thinking won't get us anywhere. Just because we're doing good work does not mean that we cannot be doing better work. And I don't want the teachers watching this, hello, to feel that they are being undersold or undercut by you know, the community who's saying we would like more or me saying I would like more because that just means there's always room for improvement. Um, that is, that is the biggest takeaway. We are all just trying to ensure that this work is being done in a way that it lasts forever and that we can consistently keep building on what has come before us and that we can keep changing and keep growing and keep evolving to be better than previous iterations of our community, period. So respectfully, I agree and we can do better. Thanks, Amanda. Does anybody else, have, anybody else wanna chime in? If not, oh. I, Well, I had a, a second comment, and this is totally off this topic, uh, but ties in well to the next item on the agenda. I just kinda wanna, uh, make a statement in response to some of the public comment that when people are vaccinated, as in if you get your vaccine tomorrow, it will be six weeks if you get Moderna before you reach what the study showed to be a 95% effective safetiness in terms of uh, prevention of moderate to severe disease. So I, I just don't want the... Um, perception to be that when teachers are up and we have a whole nother round of 65 and over to get through before teachers uh, are up, that when that happens, it's not immediately that those teachers are protected um, in terms of getting moderate to severe illness. 
So I just want that to be clear. And also that it does not take away the six foot distance and masking because we're still trying to protect other folks who may not have been vaccinated. And there are some logistical things that uh, are unique to the high school and how we move about the building um, that need to be taken into consideration. So I just kind of want that to be uh, kind of on record for folks to reflect on. Thanks, Missy. If there's if there's nothing else, I'd like to continue on. Um, we're going to do the COVID nineteen update, Darius. I think Missy did. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Um, I think Missy kind of did a nice um, entry way to that. Um, so wait, uh, we have two things uh, to talk about. Um, one is the pool testing, and then the next one is vaccinations and the moving forward. Um, the pool testing is gummed up by the state. I think they try to move too fast. Um, we are right now awaiting to get the links. I don't know if it came late this afternoon. It didn't by mid afternoon. Um, the links to have um, electronic um, approval from families to participate in the pool testing. As soon as we have that, we already got the letter ready to go. We're gonna shoot that out to families. Um, and so that they can sign up to be um, participants in pool testing. It's not gonna happen this week. Um, and it really has to do with the slow rollout by the state. And I do will point my fingers at them. I am hopeful that they're gonna give us another week at the end, on the end because they said it would start this week. I have a feeling that's not gonna happen either because of the pol politics behind that. But um, we are gonna go into pool testing for five weeks. And then um, during that time period, we'll have a conversation um, after we learn a little bit about how it's working and that kind of thing about what do we do with it moving forward after that. I think the timing wise falls nicely um, in the fact that we're still waiting for teachers vaccinations to happen. Um, and we're also in a cold months where we, you know, another layer, another layer of protections of, of surveillance testing, which is this, what this is called um, before we're outside or we can do more things outside and, and that kind of thing um, is, I think is going to be helpful. Whether or not we move forward with it, um, you know, we'll, we'll decide at that point. I'm saying that over and over again because it's not guaranteed that, you know, moving forward, the cost of, I forget what I told this group last time, um, but the cost for Frontier to do COVID, to do um, the surveillance screening uh, pool testing is $28,000 if we're going to do the last 11 months. So, you know, we're going to have to look at whether or not it's effective enough. Is it tell us enough? Um, that number will come down when teachers are vaccinated, you know, but that's a general, we took the general number of students that are here in faculty and basically, you know, slap the weekly rate on that. Um, so it's a little, so it's an inflated number. So it's probably a little bit less than that, but um, that's, you know, it's a big, it's a big price, it's a big price tag. And so we may want to look at other things. We, maybe we test certain groups, maybe we withhold testing and we bring it out if um, we, you know, our, our community is red or other indicators. So a lot of discussions about how we use it moving forward, but the first thing is to get it off the ground. Any questions on pool testing? Missy? How, how are the, well, I don't know if you have gotten this far, but logistically it's pulling just within the school. Do you, is there a method to identifying those pools? So, I mean, kind of in my mind, right, 10 teachers end up in the same pool and they're going, right, yeah. No, so, uh, yeah, what so are the the, behind identifying those pools? So the, the state's very clear. You, you don't make your pools, like you don't do all your custodians in one pool because if your pool comes out positive, you have nobody to, to help take care of the building. You, know, you don't put all your administration in one pool because if it comes out positive, they have to wait testing and you don't have administration in the building, you don't have all your teachers, you know, same kind of thing. So the, um, Sarah has been hard at work at that as well. Um, Sarah and probably Scott and George, right? I don't know, I don't want to give Sarah all the credit, but I know she, I've been kind of laying into her. She's created, um, we're creating our different, um, what do you call it? Cohorts for the pool testing, dividing classes. Um, it's a little easier at the elementary level because you just kind of do it by grade and maybe split each class and you do two pools in each class. Um, it's a little more complex at Frontier, but they're, they're doing all that and working all that out. Thanks. Okay. So you hear the questions on that. The next thing is vaccinations. Um, you know, we are, as, as Missy said, um, you know, we're doing, right now they're doing 65 and older. Um, if you're watching, you're 65 or older. I, um, 75 and older. 
at 65 and older was a happening in Greenfield Senior Center today. Sorry, first I was talking to her because they were trying to find some 65 and older people because some people didn't show up. So it, they, they started doing that there. Um, so I don't know if they ran out of 75s and they were looking for anything about 65, Missy, so I don't want to be misinformation out there, but so the, the transition's happening there soon. And then thereafter, they're talking about, you know, getting teachers in as well. So that'll happen over the next few weeks. Uh, Missy is absolutely correct. You're talking about then three weeks later, second dose, and then two weeks after that, before you're talking about a vaccinated group. And then also any, whatever the access level of all the teachers being able to access that. So what does the, the school look like? I think, um, I think it was Allison who brought that up in public comment. She brought up a good point. Like, you know, what is the planning for the next step? It's hard. We are, we've been planning since the year began. I just gotta say that we can move kind of quickly, you know, a couple of weeks being quickly to kind of start shifting things. But right now with six feet measurements and masking and our current um, protocols, we can't have everybody back. So we're gonna need different guidance from DPH that's gonna reduce the six feet um, and, you know, and such at the remainder of the last, you know, again, probably the last six weeks of the school year by the time all this is done. So we're waiting on more information on that before kind of going through the plan. We've been through so many different plans and configurations. It's kind of like we have an idea what the chessboard looks like and some of the challenges that we're gonna have. We already know the schedule. We have, uh, the other update is, and maybe George would probably have this part of his principal report, but we brought students back in for three days a week. We went from two to three days at Frontier in um, both high school and middle school. So. That's, you know, the addition of those students, they've been looking at the schedule. So they have an idea of like, okay, if we go four or five days, what does that look like? What classes do we don't have a rough room in? We, you know, and there's a lot of challenges there because some of our classes, um, if everybody comes roaring back, you know, we have 25, 26, 27 students in it, um, you know, that's a problem. So um, anyway, so those challenges are coming ahead. Don't worry, They're, those are good challenges. We'll take them. Um, you know, rebuilding the school rather than dismantling it. We spent most of the last of the year trying to doing. I think we're uh, 100% on board on. Any questions? It's just a general overview of what's going on there. Um, Statewide is not open to 65 and over. There may be times where there is extra vaccine somewhere and they need to find someone to get it into before it expires. Precisely. But just so that there's not a mass rush of 65 and older folks taking this as uh, gospel here tonight, statewide, it's not yet open to 65 and over. You know what, that might've been what it was because they were looking for, because of the snow today, I think some people didn't go turn up and so they were looking for some people. Um, thank you, Missy, I, I appreciate that because I'll, um, I'll be the one guilty of that and be in trouble. All right. Are we all set with the COVID update, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Shelly, it's your turn. And Bill, or Bill. Bill, do you have anything to say? Or do you want me to jump in? Well, you might as well jump in. I mean, there's not much history to go through. We've had a couple of meetings and you can take it from there. Okay. okay. Um, so we are gonna talk about uh, where the budget stands as it is right now. Um, Last month, the subcommittee had a meeting and saw the first draft of numbers, and then the administration worked on updates um, to get to a second draft, and now we're almost at a point where we're ready to start talking about, um, for March meeting, what the budget presentation will look like for public hearing, and then to go to um, towns for assessments, I mean, approvals in June. Um, Darius, I emailed you, shared a, a document that says school committee, budget considerations underscore school committee, not the subcommittee one. I just sent it maybe when we first started this meeting an hour ago. Um, if you could share that, that would be helpful. I can do that. I have the, te I have the technology. And I will send this out to the full school committee as well. That way you guys have it because I did not send it out yet um, to you all. And I will also send out the complete uh, budget workbook because we're just going to talk about narrative at this point. Um, so just a reminder here of what the uh, FY21 budget was and then 
you know, just as a point of reference for a firm of mind, what the one, two, three, four, five percent increases are, it's about a hundred thousand um, dollars with every increase slightly over every percent increase. Uh, so we started the first round, first draft budget with an increase of 3.63. Um, that was primarily associated with um, school lunch wages. That was the biggest increase. Just a reminder for public or for um, all of you to, as a refresher, uh, school lunch this year and breakfasts are free for any student for any meal that we serve. There's no charge. We do get reimbursement from federal and state funding. However, um, it's not even coming close to covering our costs. So. Our school lunch reserves have been depleted at this point and moving into next year while we do hope that the program can return to some normalcy uh, We do need to be fiscally responsible and make sure that we can cover the wages of our staff um, So that was one of the first additions was moving school lunch wages that are normally paid Self-funded from the school lunch program in the revolving fund. We moved those back to the general budget from there, uh, considerations with the administration on what was needed for staffing came into play, um, and George had let me know that we were in need of a half-time world language teacher, uh, so that is built into the budget, and then we had some minor increases to a couple of non-wage lines, building repairs, and then technology, hardware, and software. Um, also, obviously included, I shouldn't say obviously because maybe it's only obvious to me because I look at this every single day, but also includes um, cost of living increases based on contracts for IAs and teachers, and then also um, increases for any individual contract staff, such as an administration or custodians, cafeteria, et cetera. So all personnel, there is a wage increase built into the budget. Um, and then also um, the cost of living adjustment for some of our expenses that fluctuate a little bit, health insurance, utilities, heat, phone, you know, there's always some kind of increase there. So we built in a three and a half percent cost of living increase. So that was the major factors in draft one. Um, 3.63 is actually not a bad budget to be going into. Um, most of the other schools in our district, the elementary schools are much higher than that. So we felt pretty good about that number. Um, but we weren't quite prepared in January to talk about what assessments looked like because we had no Chapter 70 money on numbers from the state. Um, the governor's budget wasn't out yet. So having a larger discussion was really premature at that point. So um, I went back, refined, you know, kind of looked at the numbers again. Uh, we received our Franklin Regional Retirement Assessment, which was increased by 21,000. Um, we added a stipend for the Anti-Racism Committee in FY21, um, so that also had to be added in FY22, so that number is in there. And then we learned of a teacher retirement. So while we're having an increase of about 25,000, the teacher re retirement will offset some of that because we typically hire someone, usually if somebody's retiring, they're at the highest step and column in the contract. So when we look to hire for that position, Typically, you're hiring about mid of the road, mid level. So um, that had some savings for us. So the net increase results in almost a twelve thousand dollars. So it's not a significant change, uh, but the draft two came in at three point seven four. Um, so then Darius and I take a look, or you know, I plug in all the numbers into the assessment spreadsheet to see what that number looks like uh, to our four member towns. Um, and Deerfield and Sunderland came in over 5%. Sunderland came in significantly higher than 5%. Um, the original assessment for them on 3.74 was over 15% actually. So um, administratively, we decided we wanted to look at what a budget reduction would do to the assessments. Um, and our first thought was to look at alternative funding sources rather than reducing programming and personnel. Um, we obviously don't want to cut programming and personnel unless we absolutely have to. Any questions yet? That's a lot. Okay, so we looked at a couple of different funding sources. One is school choice, because school choice is really our reserve money in the event that unforeseen expenditures come up. 
Um, they might be covering things. Um, you know, we have a major building repair that comes up, say the furnace breaks, that's where the, those funds can get used. Um, we do offset the budget with some school choice funds, but uh, primarily our reserves are meant to protect us in the event that something one time major expenditure comes up. So uh, administratively, we don't feel like it is the best decision to touch the school choice reserves at this point. So then we started looking at alternative alternative funding sources from there. Um, and one of the things that came up is this new CARES Act grant. That is a federal grant um, coming through DESE. And it is relief for um, COVID impact. Uh, it's a multi-year grant uh, that can be used to support. It actually will cover us through September of 2024. And the funds will roll over each year if we do not use them all. Um, similar to the ESSER 1 grant, which Frontier has also received already, the restrictions on the funding are a little bit looser. You know, typical COVID-related things are included as well, PPE, social distance learning, cleaning, you know, HVAC is a big thing that came up for people so far this year. Um, but they added in this other line about covering other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of services in your district. So that would mean uh, we could use these funds basically to help us reduce the budget by covering salaries and wages. Um, so it's the recommendation of the administration, Darius, if you can scroll down a little bit more, uh, to use those funds to cover the school lunch wages, which is almost $90,000 that was added to the budget. Now, normally we wouldn't want to be in a practice of using one-time influx grant funds such as this to cover recurring expenditures year to year. Because if we use them this year, then that money could not be there next year. And then we're in the same position where we're increasing budget again. Um, but given that we're talking about a revolving fund and a program that has the opportunity to rebuild itself in that if kids are um, able to eat in the cafeteria again. We can open up our a la carte options. Um, we actually have families paying for lunch versus receiving just the federal reimbursement, which, you know, I'm not saying that our community doesn't need that. That free and reduced lunch program will absolutely still be there for our community. It's just it's a smaller population and we're able to bring in um, more revenues when we have some paying students and staff. You know, staff numbers are way down right now um, as far as what we're serving for meals. And then what could be classified as um, quote unquote catering, which is really kind of breakfast, coffee, muffin type service for some of our um, events or elementary schools, that type of thing is way down. So if we could bring some of those programs back next year, even in a minor degree, it would help us rebuild the program and rebuild the fund. So with the thought that in FY23, the school lunch program can carry itself once again and those wages don't have to go back to the general fund. Um, so that change would drop our general fund reduction from 3.74 to 2.97%. Uh, Gary, if you showed, scroll down to that table, it'll give people a visual there. So um, we have our starting budget in draft two, less the 90,000, and then our ending budget of 2.97. So from here, again, we take those numbers, we plug them into the assessment. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a little snapshot of the assessment. And I thought I would also give some information. I know um, Missy at least is new, and I know I don't know how much you know about how the assessment is built, and we may have public watching. Um, just a reminder for everyone how this process works. I wanted to give you a little bit of a lesson here. Um, so the assessment obviously takes into consideration the operating budget and the regional transportation needs. Um, it, the calculation of the assessment includes the local contribution that the state requires our member towns to put in. Um, that's based on the Chapter 70 formula, which takes into consideration actual enrollment from each of the four towns, um, and it's based on prior year numbers. Um, and then how much local tax revenue a city or town can reasonably raise or dedicate to operate all of the schools in the district. So the same process happens at the elementary level as it happens at um, middle and high school. So the state requirement is far less than what our actual needs are to run the school. 
Um, so any remaining budget above the state requirement is then distributed amongst the four towns based on a cost share percentage of a five-year rolling enrollment in each of from students coming in from each of the four towns. So then um, we apply some credits. Uh, I believe historically that for at least for past couple of years, the school committee has agreed to use excess and deficiency funds of $200,000 to help bring the assessments down. Um, and then we also get some reimbursement for, for regional transportation from the state. It's not reimbursed at 100%, um, but it still helps reduce that assessment. So then we're looking at what that final number is that the towns um, each have to contribute above the state. So next couple of charts, um, I wanted to show you what the enrollment is based on the chapter 70 calculation because it really clearly shows the picture of how the assessment lays out. So Conway, Deerfield and Waitley, according to the state's enrollment calculations have had a drop in enrollment from their town to Frontier. Um, Deerfield Waitley pretty significantly. Sunderland is on the opposite end. They're up 14 students according to the foundation budget calculations with the chapter 70 formula. So then we look at from there, uh, if we scroll down to the next chart, how we figure out what percentage each town has to pay. And I gave you um, 20, 21, and 22, just so you could see historically what the patterns have been. Um, but for FY22, we're looking at an enrollment, total enrollment number of 2,263 students. And then you can see Conway's 392, Deerfield 1171, Sunderland 540, Waitley um, 260. So you divide each of those numbers by the total to get the percentage of the cost share. So of Frontier's budget, Conway has to contribute on top of what the state requires, 16.59% towards whatever else is needed to be paid and the regional transportation. Um, so just a little lesson there on how that formula plays out. It's good for me to talk through that sometimes too. So thank you for going through that process. Um, so if we scroll down a little bit further, the last chart actually shows you the change in the assessment. Um, I gave you historically where we've been, FY 2021, the initial draft, uh, you can see there Conway 1.39 down through Waitley is actually seeing a reduction um, in their assessment compared to the prior year. And then in this final draft where we land right now. Um, so Conway at a 0.43 increase to their budget or their assessment over last year, Deerfield 4.32, Sunderland 14.01, and Waitley is down 6.53% from the prior year. Um, so I think when you see this, uh, there's like some sticker shock with Sunderland. Um, at least there was, I know, when I saw the numbers first. Um, but if you look back through the couple years of history, you can see that this fluctuates pretty dramatically um, year to year. And Conway had a big hit in 2020 where their assessment was over 12%. Um, and I've only been with this district for two years, only my second budget that I've put together. But I have heard that there is this cycle of every three to five years. And I'm sure some of our veteran school committee members can attest to this, that every three to five years, somebody gets hit with it where it's their turn, where there's this spike in enrollment um, and or spike in town income and revenue. And it causes this increase, um, particularly from the chapter 70 formula. Um, one thing that's not in here yet, because we just talked about this at the subcommittee meeting, is um, moving an additional amount. Oh, and I'm not going to remember what it was right now. It was to cover the um, retirement expense, right? Am I thinking about Waitley? <laughs> I'm thinking about Waitley. Darius, am I remembering yeah. Waitley? You're, you're talking about Waitley. Okay, sorry. We had Waitley right before this, so I thought that um, we made a change, but we didn't it for Frontier. Um, so we are currently at the um, increase of 2.97 um, with those assessments that we discussed. And next steps will be um, to start to have further conversations with each of the town administrators and the select board um, to start to 
you know, map out what this looks like for them and, and get their feedback. Um, but we do have to have a budget approved by March 31st. So there could be some additional meetings coming up that Darius can get into more, but I'm happy to take questions. I know that was a quick, quick, uh, short amount of time to give you a lot of information. Um, and you haven't had time to process it because you didn't get these documents ahead of time, but I will send them out to you. What did I miss, Darius? Or Bill or anyone else on subcommittee? I, guess, I think maybe we just, we talk about the, the schedule ahead just so people have an understanding about how we have to kind of go through this. So because we're in a different year, we do need to have a public hearing on the meeting, uh, on the budget rather. The bu public hearing has to be posted, I believe, 14 days, is it seven or 14 days in advance? And so our next meeting is March 2nd, where we can have, we can come meet and um, have a discussion about this budget. You can have time to look through it a little bit more clearly. And then we can have a meeting after that to have a public hearing on the budget. In most cases, we have, we vote the budget afterwards, but we always give ourselves enough time if the public hearing gives us um, such a curveball that we feel like we have to go back to the drawing board and um, and so forth. So um, that's kind of what we we sketched out in the meeting just prior to this. Um, it's it's a, I just have to say overall I got to compliment Shelly. Um, she's she's killing it um, in the in the budget realm. We have difficult budgets in um, in several of our schools in one year. Usually we have one difficult budget and we got to put a lot more effort and try to figure out how to finagle things. And this year, there's so many moving parts and so many unknowns and trying to put them all in as we go. Um, just want to tip my hat there because she's, um, you know, we, we have a gem there and she's doing a great job with that. So I, I just want to also know that there's a, other towns are also frantically trying to figure out what they're going to do with the elementary budgets and how the two are going to fit together. So, um, you know, they're going to want to have some general numbers um, sooner than later as well. So. And then I give it back to, I guess, back to Bill in the sense of anything we missed there, Bill, as well. No, I think we've got it covered pretty well. I think it's a, it's one of those things we go through just every year. It's a formula thing. There's always a big winner and there's always a big loser. And that's why we have no luck ever changing the formula because there's always one town who has absolutely no interest in changing it because it's their year to get back. And it just that's just the way it all works out. And most of the time, we hope to get three out of four and make the budget work. So, and I'll just 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 to uh, the, the 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 two drivers of 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 the budget that especially Sunderland's increase is the increase in their minimum mandatory contribution and the increase in the number of students and the the just so that people know especially you people from Sunderland we're going to have to talk to your finance committee and select board and give them a heads up because the number itself is is a potentially scary number, um, but. The the the, con, what the 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 formula for determining the minimum contribution is much more complicated than than, than the one paragraph uh, distillation that Shelley provided. That it also includes the increase in your town's net worth from uh, in real property from year to year, and it includes the increase in your town's gross uh, income in, in the income of all the people that live in your town. So it's particularly unfair to small towns like ours. Because if you have just one, so literally one or two very wealthy t families can move into your town and that will cause your town's minimum contribution to the school to go up. And people don't realize that Massachusetts actually has a system where, um, you know, rich people can move into your town and it makes everybody else's tax in that town taxes go up. So it's nuts, but it's true. Um, and. You know, and, 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 and right like right now, Conway's got a, a home under construction that's uh, 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 it's a six million dollar home. And, and there's a couple homes for sale for a million dollars. So next year, you're all going to love Conway because our minimum contribution is about to go up. Uh, but you know, this, this year, Sunderland had a, what, a new apartment complex and you had 18 new students. And, um, you know, you. That's that that correlates pretty much with right where a fourteen percent increase is indicated. It's just that's just what happens, um, and you know that that's that's the story of your budget increase. And it's any other way. I mean, it, it does seem sometimes that like it towns take turns, um, but 
and, and because one of the things in that formula is they measure all four towns in they have like a ratio if one town does better than all four than the other three towns that gets factored into it a little bit even so it's um um but it, it supposedly is all just based on the numbers and it, it, it there is no bias in it uh to, to, to alternate t towns that the same town theoretically could take it in the chin years in a row and if Sunderland keeps on sending an increase of 18 kids each year, Sunderland will be taking it on the 10 years in a row. Um, but that's a good thing. You all done, Phil? Yeah. Damien? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just uh, – is more just a question if this were to happen again. My, my recollection is last year we had a budget that was – I don't know, increased three or four percent. I can't remember the exact number. And then COVID hit, and the town came to us and insisted to try to zero. You're able to do really no cuts. If the same thing happens again this year, if the towns look at this and say, "Look, you know, can we just have a zero budget again?" That begin to be able to do that, or by doing that again two in a row, we're really looking at having a lot of cuts. So remember, I'll try this, Shelly, while you can you mute Shelly, your dog. Um, the remember that we went in when we went with the zero, we also froze the budget. So we took all the savings of our usual growth and we paid for it. We, we there are normal, you gotta remember, we have contractual growth, right? So we have a teacher's contract, we have you know, my contract, we have um, electricity, we, everything has a natural growth. And so the difference when we do a level funded, when we did a level uh, level increase, um, we took what we did to, in order to make that money, to, to find that money, we froze the budget, okay? And so we then use all our savings and to apply it there. So if, if this town comes back and says, we want to see a zero, we want to see, you know, some towns usually say they want to see about 2.5% increase. That's usually around the national, when you get above 2.5, um, they feel that's a little bit larger than they want to do. And they want to see, obviously, they want to see lower. If they came back and said, we want to only see zero, well, then we would have to cut 3%. A percent is $117,000, $114,000. So you're talking about around $340,000. So that's what we have to do. If we're going to, we, that's what we'd have to cut for level or use up all of our other savings. And if remember this year, we also used a lot of our savings. Um, and we were also bailed out by... Um, the CARES Act, and I got to thank the towns, you know, they did help us out with CARES Act money so that we had to pay for all the things to get the school up and running from HVAC to PPEs and, and, and so forth. But those, those monies did help, and we were saving some of our money for that as well. Um, so, did I miss anything in there? Did I, is that... No, right? sorry, I thought I was muted too when they started barking, and clearly I wasn't. The plow truck is in the driveway. <laughs> You got it all. All right, thank you. So basically, to sum it up, doing it two years in a row is is really uh, impractical. Right. I, I wouldn't know right now. I wouldn't know why the towns and the the town. There's a couple select board members. Well, there's a select board member here. Why the towns would say right now um, that they are anticipating a huge drop off. I and mean, we we went with a zero last year because we thought. They were talking about 20% revenue loss. Remember the doom and gloom I was coming here with that we were going to get chapter 70, whatever. And that didn't occur. And so we did give the town savings and um, they got that savings. And now we're coming back this year with, you know, slightly over two and a half. Um, I think it's a pretty good trade off in the sense that we, we, we helped them last year in preparation for what we thought was doomsday and it didn't really come that way. So um uh, that's my perspective on that. I'm sure they have a different perspective. Everybody wants a lower bill, no matter what it is, and they may change the argument there. But um, I think being being under three is where we is usually our sweet spot. We've been over three when we've had difficult times. Um, a little bit closer to two point five is probably what they want. Uh, that's for you guys to decide as you go back and talk with your towns. That's kind of this is kind of where they where we are in the budget is that we have where we're at. If you want to go further, either we have to become more risky in our reserves, meaning going to school choice or um, any of the other reserves that were kind of, you know, that you use them all one year, we don't have them for next year, or we have to start making staffing 
reductions because that's that's the next kind of thing that's open or program reductions if you want to cut sports or something like that i say that because you know there's no way in heck that's going to happen easily so you know so you know those kind of those are the next things that are on the school committee's radar so okay do we if we have to cut lower then the administration has obviously been told by me be prepared for if you have to do cuts i want to you know they're thinking about that they don't want to be thinking about that and they kind of show me what it looks like and it's not good and we don't we don't publicize that because it's you know, people are connected to those jobs. Um, and we also, um, you know, we have a, you know, we don't want panicking in the community that, oh, they're going to cut sports. I'll use sports because, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a long way to cut sports. Um, you know, if we say we're going to cut sports, that gets out there. Then you have the coaches are like, I'm going to lose my job as a coach. And then you got, you know, you, you don't kind of just throw out there. These are suggestions we could cut. So, this, you know, and bring it to you. That's unfair to put you in that spot too. If we're forced to go to those cuts, that we can't do natural cuts like retirements. That's usually what we've done a lot of to protect not you know cutting positions or cutting programs is we do retirements or student leaves that maybe had a one to one so we can reduce that one to one or an IA is no longer needed. Some of that kind of goes up and down within the budget, um, but we don't usually bring that to school committee to make that decision. But we have, and some of you have been through some difficult staffing decisions that we've had to do when we've done reductions as well. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, sorry, long we did as we. Really. That's all right. So, so just one of the other things, Darius, was that um, you know they, that towns are going. You always hear in the towns that, especially in the town that's facing the double digit increase. So your your student population is declining, and uh, you know you can't afford to make staffing reductions. You got to tighten your belt, and as you lose students, and, and so so could you speak a little bit to the uh, to the demographic stuff that came out. Um, that, that you've been sending out the, the projected student enrollment over the next week because uh, over the next 10 to 10 years or whatever, because um, uh, the, the, it, it shows steady, modest growth for Frontier and that more or less you're at a low point now. Um, yeah, so my NASDAQ report, I'll jump ahead right now to that, I think is right. garbage. And um, we uh, haven't looked at a NASDAQ report for honest feedback. They say that Waitley is going to go from 120 to 200 and something in five in six years. Um, they have us within three or four years um, adding like 80 students or something like or 100 students. Um, I don't see it in the pipeline coming up. So I don't know where they're getting those numbers from. So I'm actually part of my report there was that I'm going to ask to leave. Um, to stop paying the NESDIC dues, we're no longer we're not using their services to the two grand that they're charging us, and their reports are not helpful to us in our decision making. So, but um, to talk about, we do need to talk about enrollment. We are down ten students from last year, right? Overall, um, it's a little bit more in the direct um, in the numbers. I'm talking about choice and whatever. Going into next year, there's also the, a little bit of question mark what our enrollment is. Okay, there's going to be a huge, and we're starting to see it already in school choice applications within the elementary schools, shift where people are um, at a point where they can make a change. They've been remote, they've been homeschooled. You gotta remember our homeschool population doubled this year. A lot of those people are gonna come back to, I imagine are gonna come back to the, um, you know, back to the public schools because, you know, they were doing that for COVID purposes and such. So. We don't really know how that shift that population is going to work. And so if we're off by like 10, I think we're going to get easily get 10 back. You know, um, we couldn't even get even more as, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's been a lot of discontent and in, in, in neighboring districts are going to look for uh, different who may have stayed in their district because it's remote and, you know, but may want to choose to move out um, when things get rolling over. So, yeah, our, our, our numbers have not dropped so significantly that where they're going to say like, well, you've dropped, you know, this much. We've actually grown up in enrollment over the last couple of years overall at Frontier. Um, compared to the, we were we were at when I started at Frontier, we we're at 715. We got down as close to 600 and now we're up around 650 range. So um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but and I should. But um, that's kind of I probably go to the back page here and I can get them. But uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing. So within this budget. Are we all done with the budget proposal update? If we are, then we can go on to the track update, Darius. Uh, before we move on to the budget up the budget thing, so 
we are clear that you guys like the idea of the path moving forward. I know I say it and just like sometimes the quiet means we're all in agreement, but um, we, have a, we have a meeting on March 2nd. That's going to come really quickly. We have vacation next week and there'll be one week prior to that. Um, so it's two weeks, you know, two weeks away. It's in the third week. Um, and then we'll have another meeting maybe the following week. We can decide at that meeting. Oh, I'm going to need to post that public hearing before the March 2nd meeting. That's why I need to know this. If we're going to give it, if we're going to give ourselves time to have, right? Isn't, am I, if people are in agreement with me, just head nodding would be fine. Um, people are agreeing that we like to give ourselves a little bit of time after the public hearing. We found ourselves against the gun maybe three or four years ago, as I remember, and, and um, that wasn't good. So we're kind of in agreement. We'll, we'll, have, we'll discuss this budget to move forward to public hearing at the, at the March 2nd meeting. We can obviously change this at the next meeting, but you know, we're getting ready to move, move that forward to the public hearing. We'll have the public hearing. Following the public hearing, we'll have a school committee meeting to vote the budget or not, and then make decisions from there. Does that sound like a... Are you thinking about... Do you agree? It's your... Yeah, we... we we have yeah. to do it. We need to, before we make a final decision as a committee, we need to listen to whatever input there is to be had at the public hearing. It wouldn't make any sense to do it any other way. Right. That's why I say, well, have a, it's a scheduled vote, but we, we can certainly not vote based on the, the, the public hearing kind of within that. We, have, we can hold another meeting afterwards. All right. So I will put that together um, as well. Thank you. Track update's really easy. It's out to bid right now. They did a, um, a a visit, a site visit the other day. Um, and basically looked at, you know, they're going to, have to move some posts in order to get the machinery in and that kind of stuff. But overall, um, the bids will now be coming in, and um, we'll probably have more to talk about next month um, with that. So exciting that that's moving forward. Cool. Uh, new business. Uh, Deerfield Academy donation. We need to vote on it. Didn't we have Didn't we have it from last month and we didn't vote on it? Yeah, but I don't think we've actually received the funds yet, so I don't think we're. We ready don't have to vote. receive the funds. The, the The school committee has to. It wasn't on the agenda. Remember, I got it like the week before, not enough time to put it on the agenda. So officially, you have to accept a donation of this size. Um, so it's just a quick vote. The, the paperwork's in there. Of the twenty-five thousand to Deerfield Elementary and Frontier Regional will be split, and so I did reach out to them. They're in the process, Shelley, of getting that paperwork to us. Paperwork meeting to check. So, so we're not going to vote on it, or we are going to vote on it. You need to in pro. I mean, nobody's going to call you on it if you don't vote it. But you, our 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 policy is that you vote to accept gifts of this nature. Okay. Can I have a motion? A second. Motion. Second. Was that Bill? Was that Bill? Yeah, Bill. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, you want me to do roll call? I'll do yeah. roll call. Uh, Please. Yes. Yeah. Lynn? Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Amian? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yeah, I'm looking at the screens. Okay. And uh, Bill? I couldn't find my mouth. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> Bill, where's Bill? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. <laughs> oh, God, you're choking me up tonight. Uh, okay, uh, are we going to talk about enrollment projections, or, or Darius, are you all set with what you said a little while ago? Yeah, I think. I mean, that's basically unless there's any objections. But when I look through that data, I mean, some of it's interesting, but not worth two grand. And um, other NASDAQ things that they you know they help with is like superintendent searches, principal searches. Um, the last time we did one, we didn't use NASDAQ, we used MASC. So I think, oh, you know, one of those things I guess we can always sign back up if we find that. Um, but I've talked with some other superintendents about like, am I missing something? Are they providing something I'm missing here? And actually I think it's gonna be, they're gonna have to change their model if they're gonna keep all school systems um, uh, enrolled. So they'll save, they'll save two thousand dollars and spread over the five schools um, that we can use, and obviously to other needs, new needs. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I have nothing. Lynn, do we have anything from the collaborative? A couple of quick things, as especially as it applies to the conversations tonight. Um, well, first, there's a new interim director um, for the collaborative. Her name is Karen Reuter. But what I wanted to tell everyone is that there's professional development opportunities on anti-bias and anti-racism. Um, those are professional development for teachers who would like to take care of um, just to learn more and do better. They also have on April 12th a racial trauma conference, um, healing the hidden wounds of racial trauma in the classroom. So that's another opportunity that people can tap into. They also have um, PD on building equitable supports for children with disabilities. And we had a really good presentation on the Massachusetts Migrant Education Program. So that's it. Good Thanks, opportunities Lynn. for teachers. Thank you. Yep. Where are you, George? I'm right here. Can you see me, Bob? Uh, I can't see you yet. Oh, there you are. <laughs> You're here. Wow. Um, so uh, I sent out my report to everybody. Uh, just a just a few quick things. So we are back to three days a week for the middle school and for the high school. Um, some anecdotal uh, reports back from uh, a lot of the teachers are, are, are. I'm hearing specifically that they're actually excited to have more students in their classroom. That it feels it's starting to feel a little bit more like a typical classroom, and that it feels good. Um, you know, we are the numbers are are uh, probably. Going, we've got classrooms where we've got you know seven to eight kids uh, up to up to fifteen. We have uh, we have our AP chemistry classroom is able to hold fifteen kids right now, and and the kids are coming. Um, so that's a really wonderful thing. So um, we're excited to have that to have that going. Uh, the second the second part of my uh, my update, I think Darius already already spoke about it, but the uh, the pool testing, which we're planning on getting off the ground, hopefully the week of the twenty second, uh, and then a couple other pieces. Um, so uh, uh, Max Cheryl and Christina Quimby, who typically are in the process of putting uh, putting putting together the uh, the musical, um, they're actually in, in the process of putting together uh, um, an online musical review, which I know Olivia is a part of uh, as well, um, which is wonderful. So uh, we're we're looking forward to seeing that in the spring. Um, and I know that I didn't put it on my report, but I can report that. Um, Scott it's to start football on March 1st. So our wedge season is gonna be starting uh, in March, which is, which is so it's coming up soon. Uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. So some, some good things happening. Thanks, George. So just to follow up what George just said, cause you're all gonna say, what? We just did all these things for winter, winter sports. So we have this wedge season. It's gonna be on the agenda. Um, it's gonna be on the agenda for March 2nd. Um, to kind of go through what it's going to look like. And we may have a better idea at that point what competition looks like, um, I think, because I think that's probably the biggest concern um, that these are, most of these are outdoor sports. So we'll talk more about that at that meeting. But, um, yeah. Keith, um, and you had your hand up too, Keith. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the email I'd sent you about, like kind of class structures and and then just bring it up to the committee at large and and understand that this is really coming from uh, a person who works in the district that has had zero in-person days, and it's been really frustrating, and uh, this caused actually a lot of turmoil within the town. But as we expanded to three days, and I, I mostly saw this from my daughter, and I've heard it from others, that the uh, the internet cafe, that's a lot of that is kids sitting in the auditorium with their teachers remote, and just for example, I saw my daughter, like, you know, is there for like four hours. It's just sitting and doing some, it's, 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 I appreciate the, the 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 class sizes, you know, growing and saying, you know, the kids are motivated to go. But there there are others that, and I know, I, and I don't have the easy answers that, but that model is not motivating for kids to attend. And I was wondering if, just trying to come up with thinking outside the box, is there anything, especially for seniors, is there anything that we can do as we go into this? Like, can can we? Can the library be accessed instead of just everybody in the auditorium? Can we do outside activities? Can they do lunches outside? Can we have classes in hallways with, where maybe you have uh, student leaders or you have monitors going back and forth? Is there something that we can do, you know, other than just like changing classes or, or staying home that like can just prevent provide right, something right. different as we expand to three days? 
And, and we've been eliciting, we've actually been getting a lot of parent feedback about that because honestly, Keith, you're not the only, you're not the only parent that's, that's concerned about that. It's something that we're in the process of talking about. I mean, uh, right now, and, and I, this is obvious, this is a great time for me to pitch if there's anybody out there that would like to be a substitute teacher. I mean, honestly, I mean, we, I mean, that's because that's one of the challenges that we're running up against is obviously staffing when we're talking about something like that. So, um, so, you know, and we're hoping that with the warmer weather, once we can start getting kids more outside and things like that, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's something that we're actively talking about trying to find solutions. Um, but uh, like I said, a lot of it sort of centers around the staffing issues. Um, so, you know, it, if we could have help rectifying that, I think that we would probably be able to take it in more directions. So if, even the substitute thing, uh, I would assume there'd be like a Corey check, but you could just have adults from the community just act as monitors because they, would, they wouldn't be actually teaching because the, the, the instruction right. would still be happening online. So you Correct. could be actually even, do we have the classroom space to, to make me some moves in that regard? Yeah, we do, have, we do have space for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so I appreciate the, uh, the just trying to think about, think outside the box a little bit. Yeah, and like I said, we're, we're consistently thinking about that because we realize that that's one of the challenges. I think Olivia had a question. I think it's probably about the same thing, but go ahead, Olivia. Yep. <laughs> I remember um, it was similar. Um, my, It's been more motivating for the kids to go to school when they have classes that, of course, have teachers and kids in them. I mean, why wouldn't it? And it's been great and wonderful, and that's been really, really awesome. Um, but again, similarly to Keith, you know, I, I am in the fortunate position where one of my children can drive and I can dismiss her when she has four classes in a row <laughs> um, or her teacher isn't there so she can come home and do that instead of sit um, in the internet cafe for that. Um, but I I agree. I think if we all, you know, put our feelers out um, and just let people know what George has been saying um, is that, you know, if we had some, um, some people from the community who would be able to do that um, because and understandably, you can't just have a bunch of kids in a classroom by themselves and hope that they're doing their work on their computer, right? right? So, um, so, um, so um, making that happen would be awesome. And if I um, didn't already work, I would absolutely um, be on that. So, um, uh, but I, I'm really appreciative of the move to 3Ds. And I think overall, um, it, it has made a difference, um, certainly um, in a lot of the kids that I've talked to. So I'm really glad that that's happened. Thanks, Olivia. Does everybody else have anything else on this nice long evening meetings? Nothing? I need a motion to adjourn then. Oh, I'm sorry, Darius. Did you have anything else you Yeah, I have a three page report I'd like to go through, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Some of us have been at three meetings tonight, so uh, we're, we're a little burnt, a little stuff. I think the stuff in my oven is burnt already, too. So <laughs> uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. Roll call, Judy, please. Uh, you don't want to just raise hands? Okay. Good job, so everybody. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>